Hello and welcome back for a new episode of The Ball Club, Conversations with Leaders. The Ball Club is a webinar series that provides valuable insights from successful investors and financial leaders from around the world. My name is Sam North. I am the trading school lead here at eToro and I am happy to be your host today. On The Ball Club today, we have Janine Yorio, who is the CEO of Every Realm, a metaverse innovation platform Every Realm invest in, manage and develop assets, including NFTs, virtual real estate, metaverse platforms, gaming and infrastructure. Janine was previously the CEO of Compound, a fintech app, and previously worked in private equity and in real estate and hotel development. Janine, how are you? I'm doing great. It's so good to be here, Sam. Awesome. Where are you, uh, where are you logging in from today? New York City. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, to, to get started, there'll be there'll be many people listening to this that would have heard of the metaverse, but maybe don't know exactly what it is. How would you go about describing it? And then how does real estate play a role within that? The metaverse is the next evolution of the internet. It's what happens when the entire internet starts behaving like a video game. So instead of 2D websites, uh, websites will become 3D web spaces that you can walk into, meet your friends there, and do all the things you're accustomed to doing on the internet today, but do it in a completely different environment, one that feels more like a video game. Virtual real estate, metaverse real estate is uh, an abstract concept that we've used to describe owning the space upon which you can build content in the metaverse. So because many different metaverse platforms, companies building these video game-like environments are starting to open for content creation, investors have the opportunity to go in and buy the metaverse real estate, which is the space upon which you can build content in those platforms. That's metaverse real estate. Today, Every Realm is one of the most active investors and developers in metaverse real estate on the planet. We own holdings in 26 metaverses. We own over 3,000 metaverse real estate NFTs. We're also one of the most active developers. We've developed over 100 projects across seven different metaverses uh, and look to build a lot more in the coming year. Wow, sounds, sounds fantastic. So, I, I mean, you, you briefly touched upon every, every realm there, but how would you say it, it's kind of shaping the metaverse then going forward? So every realm began as an investment platform. We started mm-hmm. investing in metaverse real estate, and then we figured out we could actually generate a lot of alpha if we also developed it. So about six months ago, we started developing our own projects in the metaverse, And the metaverse is not just a new form of technology, but it's something that is being built around this concept of Web3 and really uh, around a crypto ethos. So it's community driven and it's all about finding communities that want to have a home online and then incentivizing them for building content and being a part of the platform. So we've been building spaces in the metaverse for different communities and that's what we're going to continue doing. We've built spaces for ultra high net worth um, owners who are looking to have flashy private islands in the metaverse. We've built a retail mall in the metaverse. It's designed for people that love digital fashion, meaning clothing that your avatar can wear. In the next couple of weeks, we're launching a community in the metaverse just for people that love ASMR. So we're doing very specific things to build spaces in the metaverse so that people that can't readily gather in the real world have a space to gather online. Fantastic. Fantastic. You, you've studied previously, obviously, at Oxford and Yale, two you know, notoriously superb universities. You've created companies and held uh, roles in private equity investment uh, firms, amongst others. How have all of these experiences shaped sort of who you are today and how have they helped your work with, with every realm as well? Well, I think even more important than where I went to school is that I've always been an entrepreneur. I've been starting companies since I was a little girl. My very first business was selling bread that was shaped like a teddy bear (laughs) door to door when I was about 10 years old. And I think I've always been good at identifying opportunities that others aren't seeing. And that's what happened to us about a year ago when we launched Every Realm, actually the predecessor to Every Realm, when Metaverse Real Estate was something that a select few group of people were starting to talk about. But my colleagues and I had the sense that it was something really exciting. And if we were excited by it, then other people might be soon. And so we started this company before Meta changed its, before Facebook changed its name to Meta, before Metaverse became this buzzword, because we could sense that the world was changing, crypto was changing the world, video gaming was eating the world, um, these virtual environments that were taking off during the pandemic because children were spending massive amounts of time in Fortnite and Roblox 
and Minecraft were going to dramatically impact how that generation interacts with technology. And we saw this playing out in this unique asset class, which is metaverse real estate. And we wanted to create a way for other people to invest in this fairly abstract idea in a way that's really straightforward. And that's how we ended up starting Every Realm. Today, the company does a lot more than just invest, but that's that, that's our roots. It was, it was seeing this niche opportunity that was difficult to understand, but exciting, and building a framework that allowed uh, more of a mainstream investor base to participate in that category. Superb. So from, from selling bread shaped to teddy bears to working in the metaverse, who would have, who would have thought it back then? There is a uh, curious path. <laughs> part of um uh every realm is is the realm academy which is the yes. premier online campus in the metaverse what exactly is this and why is education in these areas and industries so important in your opinion well the metaverse is still a fairly new concept and a lot and a lot of people are trying to figure out what it is and what it means for their career what it means for their company and a lot of people were reaching out to me personally and asking me to come speak to their C-suite and explain the metaverse. And there just aren't enough hours in one day in order for me to do it for everybody that wanted it. So we ran as an experiment, this idea of an online university, and it ended up working really well. We had 500 students that graduated from the first cohort, a mix of people just starting out in their careers and more senior executives all of whom were joined together by this desire to learn about the metaverse. And many of the classes actually took place in the metaverse. So it was in a video chat environment, kind of like Zoom, but then sometimes they went on field trips into the metaverse. There's a campus that we built for Realm Academy Insomnium Space, which is a metaverse. And what happened was the student body, much like in real life, started meeting after hours. So they would meet for class and then they would meet for you know, virtual drinks and, and virtual pop-up dance parties, and they formed a community online. And we realized that online learning actually works really well in the metaverse, especially given the technology limitations that exist with the metaverses that have been launched today. So it was a really exciting experiment for us in that, number one, the content and the idea was really well, was well received. And then the technology actually worked really well. It was very compatible with what it is people hope to gain from an online educational experience. We're actually beefing up our offerings at Realm Academy, creating more specialized vocational tracks, um, adding new styles of learning um, and, and even new professors who bring a very different vantage point to the table. So we're really excited to become the preeminent university in the metaverse and figure out how to offer a wide variety of educational offerings that speak to a very disparate group of students. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, look, looking back in, in, in time, many people would have had doubts about, I guess, the internet when it first came about, about the radio and looking back, these are now incredible inventions and we wouldn't be where we are now without those. But what would you say to those people who are maybe doubting the metaverse at the moment for those who who don't think it's going to be here to say what would be like your your pitch to change their mind i think the only people that doubt whether the metaverse are here to stay are people that don't have children <laughs> anybody who has children who survived the pandemic and pandemic lockdown realized that this way of interacting with technology has become completely core to how children interact with technology they are not content with a 2d scroll um, even TikTok is not interactive enough for today's youth. They want to walk into virtual environments. They want to have audio chat so that they can talk to their friends. They often have some sort of YouTube or Twi Twitch stream playing at the same time. They, uh, they buy things and they own things and they earn things in these metaverse platforms that then become their primary source of social status. So much the same way when we were children, we wanted to have expensive sneakers. They're looking to do that in the metaverse. They want Fortnite skins. They want to have the biggest house in Roblox. And so these status symbols and spending real world money in virtual worlds comes very naturally to them. And it's important to them. That's how they socialize. And for them, the metaverse is where they get their entertainment in the form of video gaming. They're socializing in the form of video chat. It's their social media. It's where they see their friends and what their friends are doing. And it's also e-commerce. So it's an all-in-one experience for them. And that has shaped how they interact with technology and what they will expect from the internet and technology moving forward. So while the metaverse may still seem very abstract for the adult population that isn't spending time there, that's not true of anybody under the age of, say, 16. Yeah, no, completely makes sense. Completely makes sense. Um, I saw, saw a quote on, on your website and absolutely loved it. And it was, 
Uh, the only way the metaverse becomes interesting is if there are things to do and people to see and places to go when you get there, which is so, so true. Um, what initially excited you about it? And for those listening to this, apart from you know real estate, et cetera, what, what do you think people should be excited about in the future? I think different things excite different people. And that's the beauty yeah. of building things in technology. You can build very specialized environments for very niche communities, like what we're doing for ASMR. You know, you would you'd probably never build a real world building just for people that like ASMR because there aren't enough people in any one place that could ever gather yeah. for it. But when you start removing physics and construction costs and real world limitations, you can build homes for online communities that are actually fairly large if you, if you allow the entire world to participate, but which would be cost pro prohibitive if you made them geographically specific in the real world. And I think that's what's so exciting about the metaverse. You can get really big communities like people that love, say, uh, European football, right? Yeah. That's an enormous community and they might gather online, but you can also find a very niche group of people that participate in, you know, a more niche sport like curling, you yeah. know, and they, they might also want a gathering space and there might be people, curling is very popular in Canada, but there are people from Canada who've been relocated to Singapore and those same people might want to meet with others. And in the metaverse, this suddenly becomes feasible. It becomes cost-effective, distance no longer matters, and you can socialize by tribe, by interest, by geography, by age, by marital status, you know, you can slice up the population lots of different ways and people can find what they're looking for in the metaverse. And that concept of placemaking, building spaces that foster certain behaviors and encourage people to do things within those spaces is what I've been doing my entire career. So I come from a financial engineering background, but I was always in the hospitality sector. And if you think about what a great hotel does. It's not just a building. It's not just a place to crash at night. It makes you feel a certain way when you walk in there. So, you know, if you've walked into a certain hotel, you're like, oh, this is where the cool kids stay, right? Or, oh, this is where the power brokers come when they're in New York City or London or Hong Kong. And, and it makes you feel a certain way. Even if you didn't feel that way before you crossed the threshold, you walk into that space and it triggers in you this very visceral and, and generally positive reaction that makes you do certain things and behave a certain way. And that's what we can do in the metaverse too. We can place make, we can program spaces through good design, through events, through music, through partnerships and influencers and do all the same things we do in the real world to make spaces exciting. We bring those same tricks into the metaverse and catalyze online community building there. So good. So good. I mean, they, there's many things I've already thought about just over sort of the last week about what really excites me in the metaverse. And I think the ability to go to any sports stadium in the world and like watch a game, for example, that would just be incredible. The best seat in the house with your friends and other pe like minded people. I think that always front row seats. Right. Always. Court always. Yeah. right. Why? Why would you ever sit in the nosebleed seats in the metaverse if you don't absolutely have to? That's the beauty of the metaverse. You can do things you can't do in the real world yeah, and you can go. It. And you know what? If you don't like that play, you don't like it when that guy uh, misses misses the goal. You can uh, take out a machete and, and you know, uh, exact your revenge because that's what you can do in a video game like it. Yeah. And that's the allure is you can do things that are more risque, more illicit, like downright ethically wrong in the metaverse. You can you can act out on those um, deep seated primal urges that we have that we can't do in the real world. And while we can vilify video game play that encourages shooting people and blowing things up, I think, unfortunately, it's here to stay. You mm. men seem to enjoy it a great deal. And I think <laughs> no matter how much mothers everywhere complain about it, um, it, it is a big driver. It's getting those, you know, bestial urges out uh, through video game play. And you can do those things in the metaverse. And then you can turn around and go socialize. You know, it, yeah. it, it is an environment that's very fluid where you can do lots of different things without any societal constraints, monetary constraints, physical constraints. You can fly, you can float, you can time yeah. travel. You know, that's the beauty of the metaverse is we can we can take all those crazy ideas we have in our dreams and we can live them out. And um, that's where I think the possibilities start becoming really exciting. It's not just going to a football game. It's maybe playing and maybe it's, you know, football players are playing with basketball players or maybe they're playing, uh, you know, it, the way that Quidditch is played in the air. It's, it's, yeah. it's mind bending when you start thinking about what the possibilities are. They're really infinite. Yeah, I guess that's what's so exciting because it's still so early, right, in the whole grand scheme of things. So God just knows in, in 10, 20 years, it's just going to be mind-blowing. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, I saw on your, on your Twitter, you, or 
I think it was relatively recently, but you met with uh, with Paris Hilton, who's obviously quite big into to Web Web 3.0 and also notice your company has, has got many sort of big investors. Uh, and we've seen banks get into the metaverse, JP Morgan, et cetera, buying space there, for, for example. What do you think excites big investors and, and banks about this area at the moment? Well, banks are driven by money mm-hmm. and, and, and customers. And I think they're excited to see how metaverse changes their reality. They're generally not the most uh, forward thinkers. So I think they're they're sort of cautiously watching from the sidelines. Chase built a branch in the metaverse in a yeah. retail mall that we had developed. Um, I think it's more interesting the celebrities and what they see. They see a place where you can connect directly with your fans. They don't have to go through their agents. They don't have to have the distance that they would have if they were to do, you know, an event at, 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 in a concert venue where you're separated by great distance from the stage or you're concerned about security, right? There's there's no chance that you uh, kidnap kidnap a, a star in the metaverse. So they can have that intimate experience with their fans without a lot of the same real world concerns and breaking down those barriers and shortening the distance between the fan base and the entertainer or the athlete or the celebrity is very appealing to them because they've always been um, disconnected by managers and agents and movie producing studios and leagues and teams and all these layers that keep them from their fans, you know, and it's, it's a necessary evil, but in the metaverse, it's, you don't have to have it. You can have a direct relationship with your fans. They can build communities where you connect directly to them. You can have a forum where you connect directly to them. We saw that and Twitter, you know, where celebrities started having direct relationships and think about now if all of a sudden it's a 3D social space where they can have a similarly direct relationship without worrying about their personal safety. It, it breaks down a lot of barriers that they've been dealing with for the last hundred years um, that, that create a lot of very interesting possibilities. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Very exciting. I mean, for, for content creators, for developers, for, for artists and, and just in general, really creative people i guess that the metaverse is a really exciting place um i guess this is a kind of like a trillion dollar question really but are there any areas that aren't currently in the metaverse that you think will appear in the future or is actually not knowing that maybe what's also exciting there are very few things that are actually in the metaverse today and therefore there's so much white space that's what's so exciting We're, we're really at the earliest days right now i think most of what we've seen thus far is really proof of concept yeah um, especially in the crypto-based metaverses, there are there are metaverses that have been around for more than a decade. Second Life, Imview, Minecraft has been around for a while. Roblox, and, and we've seen the possibilities as we start thinking about what happens when adults start spending lots of time in these virtual worlds, and what happens when the economies inside them become really robust. We saw some of that with Second Life. We've seen that with Imview, where you have people starting businesses and making money in the metaverse that translates into meaningful amounts of real world income. So if you then put those economies on the blockchain where it's easy to take the money out of the system and spend it in the real world, it unlocks a lot of possibilities. And the beauty of the human mind is its creativity knows no bounds. So I have no doubt that once you give people these foundational layers and metaverses that are customizable, where users can can build user-generated content, we're going to see so many exciting new things, the likes of which we can't even imagine today. Yeah, that's what excites me. I think it's just trying to trying to picture it. And then you look back in, in 10, 20 years and you just be like, wow, mind blown. Yeah. Um, for, for those that, that don't know, and you said this a few times already, but there, there's obviously more than, than one metaverse. Which are the sort of the main ones? And, and do you think in the future, will it be a case of like, say, winner takes all or will individuals head to the one that's easiest to use? How do you think it's going to work? Uh, There are already hundreds of metaverses in development um, and dozens that have launched. So I definitely don't think it's going to be a winner take all situation, but there will be some that are much more dominant than others. They'll have a lot more users. They'll be better at attracting larger communities. They'll have better technology. They'll have better user interfaces. They'll be more easily used on your mobile. One of the big issues with metaverse technology is it's very heavy and, and difficult to use from even a traditional laptop or desktop machine. Oftentimes they're really built for gaming rigs and, and, and better, better left to a desktop experience as opposed to mobile, but a lot more people have smartphones than they do computers. So 
the, the metaverses that crack the code on how to allow people to maybe have more robust interactions on desktop and then also be able to check in on their virtual existence from mobile, I believe will have much more long-term traction. But I think there will be thousands, if not millions of metaverses, highly specialized, interconnected, just like the internet. Yeah. Just like there is Google, which is a very dominant website, right? It's ultimately a website, but there are millions of other websites. And sometimes you need some of those other websites. If you're looking to book an appointment to get your hair cut, you need a website that is by far less powerful than Google, but no less useful to you at that specific moment. And there will be all of these niche metaverse experiences, some of which will be built on other platforms. Others might be standalone we don't know yet exactly how it's going to shape up, but when you think about the enormity of the opportunity, I think it's helpful if you think about the metaverse as a synonym for the internet. It's a vast and interconnected network of interactive social spaces that, you know, there will be dominant players and smaller niche players, but there's going to be an almost infinite amount and lots and lots of evolution along the way. Yeah, really good way to think about it. Um, last couple of uh, questions, and I would love to get your your thoughts on on Facebook's role in the metaverse, especially with their, I think it was $10 billion annual investment announcement in, in that field. Have you got any sort of thoughts on, on, on Facebook or, or Meta as, as a whole at the moment? Yeah, I think Facebook is obviously a force to be reckoned with. They have an enormous yeah. war chest. They have a lot, a lot of talent and a, and a lot of traction. They have a lot of users but it's very validating to the rest of the space. When Facebook announced that they were moving full bore into metaverse, it just validated a lot of the other smaller players that had been nosing around the category for the months leading up to their announcement. I think that Facebook has a lot of baggage in the community. And it's also generally believed to be something that older people use, you know, Facebook and Instagram. If you ask somebody who's 16 about Facebook and Instagram, it's not what they use for social media. They're on Discord. Um, and they're, you know, they, if you ask children, yes, they use TikTok, but even that is for adults. Yeah. You know, Discord is really their primary social media network, which is something that very few adults use on a regular basis. So every generation seems to be creating its own social media construct. And Facebook and Instagram were among the first, but they're going to need to do a lot to become relevant for the next generation and also um, deal with a lot of the political baggage that they have in terms of selling our data and using yeah. our own content to monetize their platform. And this next generation is very skeptical. So I think while they are likely to innovate very quickly and build some big, exciting things, mass adoption of their platform is going to have to deal with a lot of that negative public backlash before they see a lot of mainstream adoption. Yeah, I, I, it's so interesting you there mentioning about sort of Facebook, Instagram, generally sort of like a... Um, older crowd and I've never felt so old myself than when I spoke to my friends who have kids and I was saying oh, so are they on WhatsApp or whatever and they were like WhatsApp no way they would never use WhatsApp and I'm like oh they use Snapchat to talk or Discord I was just like wow so they you're using Gmail. WhatsApp they think Gmail's terrible like <laughs> my own children they're like why do you use Gmail it's awful you know yeah. so it's generational right it's, yeah. it's generational and it's hard to accept that your technology is becoming dinosaur technology, but that is how technology works. And there is a whole new stack that young people are using and those young people will become adults and have very different expectations from their technology stack. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting, I guess, because we're, we're talking about the younger generation here. And actually, I think from an investing standpoint, it's something definitely worth looking into is what are the younger generation going to be doing in 10, 15 years time? Because those are the areas that are going to thrive, right? So look, thinking of it that sort of way, are we saying, and you sort of said it was, it was still really early on in the metaverse anyway, but are we saying it's, it is so early now that to reach its sort of full potential is maybe 10, 15, 20 years? Or do you think it is sooner than that? Or is it hard to know? I think it's sooner than that. I mean, 10, yeah. 15, 20 years, you know, today's 10 year olds will be 30 and 30 years old. That's, yeah. that's a long way off. I think this technology is evolving rapidly. Children are using technology at ever younger ages. I think in three to five years, yeah. we're gonna see a whole new realm of possibilities in technology. I don't think it's gonna be a decade away. Things yeah. are happening very fast. There's a lot of capital flowing into the space. So um, the innovation will happen very quickly. And there are a lot of really smart people trying to figure out solutions to the problems that, that are required to solve to get this, this space uh, off the ground and to foster more mainstream adoption. So I think it's going to be faster than that. 
Yeah, cool. What, what about um, like regulation? Is that an issue or is that just, you know, something that's going to happen over time, but it's is just something, you know, to, to maybe keep an eye on in the background? I mean, regulation is always something to keep, keep an eye on, but I don't think that's our biggest uh, risk in this category. A lot of the things that are being built are built on the blockchain. And obviously there's a lot of regulatory scrutiny over things in that arena. Um, the New York Times loves to write about the impending doom that the metaverse is going to cause and all of the, the, the legislation necessary to, to protect us from it. I, I think it's overblown. I think they're trying to sell newspapers. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that that's the major risk um, that we have to worry about. I do think it's more basic than that. I, I wonder what happens to a generation of people who are raised spending hours and hours a day online in these virtual worlds. I'm more worried about it from a biological standpoint than I am even from a sociological one. Mm. And what happens to your, to your brain if you, uh, if you bombard it with dopamine um, in the form of, of video games and, and Roblox from a really young age? I worry about that more than I do uh, internet predators creeping up. I mean, yeah, it's always a risk, but I think the, the risk of the biological implications is by far greater. Ah, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, okay. Fi- final question and uh, an interesting one for for I know a lot of people that are listening. And I mentioned I was I was speaking to you uh, today to all my friends, and, and metaverse is something they're fascinated by. And they want to learn more, so they're definitely going to listen and, and tune into this. But my question, final question, is what what will it take to 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 make the metaverse a reality? Well, I think it already is a reality. Okay. But I think what we're talking about is what is it going to take for there to be mainstream adoption so that you and I yeah. actually, instead of doing this on Zoom, which we're doing now, that we do it in the metaverse. Yeah. We're sitting across from the table. I think there's a mix of technology that has to be developed on the hardware side. Um, computers need to be able to handle the uh, processing speeds required. Audio needs to get better. You know, one of the things you've seen after spending two years on Zoom it's fine if you and I take turns talking like walkie talkie style, but we can't have a sidebar conversation. We can't really cut each other off or overlap the way we would if we were sitting face to face. Spatial audio, meaning if I walk closer to you or farther away, needs to get better. Uh, video quality needs to get better. I do think humans like to see facial expressions and avatars that are not, you know, that look like Lego people are only so. Um, applicable. There's so much to be read from somebody's facial expressions. So there's a photo real quality that I think we expect to see. And then programming, you have to give people something they can't find elsewhere. Like I never knew how much I wanted to pin images that I'd found around the internet until Pinterest gave me Pinterest. And I think the metaverse has to, it will happen the same way. There are going to be some killer applications, which haven't happened yet where all of a sudden people who you might never have thought would gravitate toward the metaverse are suddenly there because they can't get it elsewhere. Much the same way that grandparents flock to Facebook because they could see pictures of their extended family and their grandkids, right? They're not there to like and, and all these things. They're there to see pictures of their extended family. And there will be these unintended use cases that drive mass adoption in the metaverse, giving people things that are difficult to get in any other format. And that's when I think we'll start to see massive adoption amongst um, pockets of people that you would not have expected to have shown up for this this category yeah awesome well yeah i think that's that's what excites me like you said it is a reality now but it's still so early on so and early. i think the possibilities are, are endless they're exciting and yeah one to one to watch for for sure and, and janine look thank you very much for, for joining you. us today it's been an absolute pleasure having you thank on. you you too bye-bye awesome. thank you guys <laughs>